This is my hometown. It's called Youngstown, and it's in the state of Ohio near the Pennsylvania boundary. In Youngstown, we make steel. We make steel and talk steel. I guess it's the same in Sheffield, England, or that place the Russians built in the Urals, Magnitogorsk. I'd like to tell you something about how we make steel here, and while I'm at it, introduce you to some friends of mine who work in the mills. Look down any street in town, and you'll see the mills at the end of it. There are 25 miles of them along the Mahoning River, and today they're busy day and night. Every eight hours, the shifts change. 15,000 men to the ship. The men going to work can see the freight trains bringing in the raw materials. Iron ore, coal, and limestone. This is the ore. It looks like dirt, but in a few weeks it'll become part of a ship, a tank, or a gun. And in peacetime, an office building, a bridge, or a dam structure. An overhead crane picks it up and carries it over to the skip hoist, which take it up to the top of the blast furnace. In the blast furnace, the boys smelt the ore into iron, the first step in making steel. The molten iron comes out at 3,300 degrees. The slag comes up to the top like cream in a pitcher and goes out the other way. That's Johnny Chonko on the snort valve controlling the blast. When things get too hot, he's got to think quick and move quicker. Peter Zeman's the blower, head man on the ship. He tells him when it's time to stop the flow. And this is Frank Mele, a friend of mine. Frank came here from Italy 45 years ago. He's got his own place up on the hill. Come Christmas, it's full up with his children and grandchildren. Frank doesn't talk much, but I know how he feels about his home, his kids, and the satisfaction he gets knowing they'll grow up with the same chance as the kids next door, or any other kids in the country. This is the open part where the molten iron from the blast furnace is mixed with scrap iron and the two purified into steel. I remember the first time I saw it, the size of the place, the noise, the sirens wailing when the big stuff moved overhead, and the heat hitting you like a solid wall. It's something you don't forget.
is it's flagging, lining a furnace with dolomite. This protects the wall of the furnace against the extreme temperature. Down the line, Bob Wentworth is charging scrap iron. Scrap that came from farms, backyards, and attics all over the country, collected by school kids and housewives to do their part in the war. Next door, Tommy Hughes is giving one of the furnaces a drink of hot iron from the 35-ton ladle. This iron is fresh from the blast furnace. These are the foremen, Bill Riley and John Strauss. John came here from Croatia. He's got two sons. The older is a captain in the army. The younger, Ed, is still in high school. He's a substitute on the football team. Next year, when he gets a little more beef on him, he'll be a regular. Of course, it isn't all football. Education comes first. The principal, Mr. Glasgow, understands the kids. He believes they should help plan their own schooling. Ed's interested in flying, so along with languages and literature, he gets courses in physics and aerology and internal combustion engines. It means a lot to have free education like this for your kids. If you listen in on these youngsters, of course you'll hear them talk about football and dances and things of that sort, but you'll hear other things too. Talk about what kind of a world this can be after the war. Things maybe their parents didn't talk about enough. They know what's going on, these kids, and that's all to the good. <laughs> Yes, if you listen to them, you get to appreciate how much democracy depends on education. Education for everybody. In the open hearth, the steel's nearly finished. The first and second helpers take a sample. Mike Kubinski's the first. Earl Strong is his assistant. Mike's people came here from Czechoslovakia. Earl's ancestors came from England in the 17th century, when there wasn't much to America but a few colonial villages along the coast. By inspecting samples of the molten steel, the boys can tell exactly when the furnace should be tapped. Earl's a musician. He plays bull fiddle with the Youngstown Symphony Orchestra. No professionals here. They're all steel workers and their wives and daughters. Maestro, Michael Picocelli, is a timekeeper in the mills, and there's been plenty of bad jokes about that.
Missing a Piece by Gerald Meyerovich, the Youngstown boy who's in the Navy now. Steel men get in the habit of doing things together, like in the mill. The open hearth gang rattles out the hole in the rear of the furnace and lets the steel out, roaring and spitting at 3,000 degrees. The pit gang dumps in alloys to give it the special qualities they want in this batch. This ladle weighs a hundred tons, but the overhead crane handles it like a toy. Lifts it over to a line of ingot molds where it's tapped off. We call this teaming. Just to be on the safe side, another test is made to be sure that the alloys have been added in proper amounts. The ingots are carried over to the blooming mill where they get their first shaping. It looks rough, but these rollers squeeze the ingots down to a tolerance of a sixteenth of an inch. George Bannon and Clarence Kinney control the operation from the pulpit. They've been doing this together for so long, they work like one man with four hands. When the ingots flatten to a slab, Fred Ingram takes over. He cuts the slab with hydraulic shears under many tons of pressure. Fred's a shop steward for the union, which has an agreement with the mill. He represents the workers on the plant's labor management committee. These days, they're discussing production problems, and they've been doing a great job up there, working together, planning together, figuring out new ways to make more steel. We've got the machines, like this one in the hot strip mill, where in one continuous operation, a slab of steel is flattened into a sheet. Each roller operates at a different speed, synchronized to handle the slab that's growing longer and thinner and moving faster all the way down the line. hours ago it was iron ore. Now it's finished and on its way to become a part of the new world it's building. We've proved we can lick production problems. We've got the equipment, the science, everything it takes to get the job done. But when the war is over, we're going to have other problems. We know about that in Youngstown. We've had it here before. There were times when there was no smoke in the sky. The mills were quiet. The streets full of men, angry, questioning, wondering. We're beginning to understand that these things don't just happen in one place, they happen everywhere. We're thinking that all this production all over the world that's doing such a job in a war can do a job in peace, too, if we can just learn to work together. And I guess we're beginning to learn.
Testing, one, two, three.